Chapter 18 Academic Shetnin Who is he? We are accustomed to describing a person through his biographical outline, his record of service, the titles bestowed upon him, but in the present instance all that would be meaningless. In the Bible it says, By their fruits ye shall know them. Academic Shetnin's fruits are the happy, beaming faces of the children studying at his school along with those of their parents. Then who is he? Natalia Sergevna Bondarchuk is not only an award-winning Russian actress, she is also a member of the board of the International Rorik Foundation, a UN non-governmental organization. She told me, I have talked with many famous preachers and teachers in various countries of the world, but I have never been so impressed as here. We may well have come into contact with a great Vidun. I say Vidun not because of his acquaintance with the old Vedic scriptures, but because he knows what many of us don't. I should also like to record my impressions from my meeting with Mikhail Petrovich Shetnin, but I am not a specialist in the educational field, and hence my terminology may not be all that accurate, so I shall try to reproduce his own words as faithfully as possible. At one point, I was walking down a corridor of the school building along with Natalia Sergeevna, her cameraman, and Mikhail Petrovich. We came to a spacious hall opening onto the corridor where a number of tables had been set up. At these sat children of various ages, all intensely engaging in some kind of mysterious project from which neither our presence nor that of the video camera could distract them. From time to time, one or, or another of the children would get up and go off somewhere, and then come back again. Sometimes they would go over to examine the numbers on a bulletin board hanging on the wall. At other times, they would thoughtfully pace around the room. Some of them were talking among themselves, arguing or explaining things to each other. Mikhail Petrovich, what is going on? asked Natalia Sergeevna. Here, you are basically witnessing attempts to establish contact. If the contact is successful, the children will be able to master the 10-year school maths program in just one year. That is their assignment. It will happen when the children are able to make contact with those who possess similar knowledge, and the degree of openness in their relationship is important. Their field elements will then be able to share information. You're familiar with the observation made by simple folk, love at first sight? When people in love catch each other's meaning with hardly a word between them. You haven't opened your mouth, and he's already got it. You can see the whole point here is to make the children feel free and unencumbered. This place, this is the place they can ask any question, get up, and come and go as they please. Maintaining relationships is the important thing. Working on relationships is not only very important for the children, but also for the ones organizing the activities. So we take off the brakes, so to speak. We refrain from focusing on age. Over there, right next to the 15-year-old Ivan Alexandrovich, is sitting 10-year-old Masha. We also have a university student named Sergei Alex Alexandrovich, who's actually finishing university this year. And how old is he? He'll turn 18 this year. And he's finishing university at 17? 17 in this generation, but we generally try not to refer to the notion of age. That's a very important point. If you, if you will notice, here the teachers tend to blend in with the pupils. True, it is a rather special group. The ones you see here are those that weren't able to participate in the construction, and they have quite a task ahead of them, assimilating the 10-year school maths course, so they, in turn, will be able to share their knowledge with those who are currently occupied in the construction. And it will all come about, because what is germinating in them is a system of interdependent integration elements. Our collective ancestral memory has knowledge of the laws of the cosmos, as well as techniques for living in cosmic space. So it is very important to reject any suggestion that there is something they don't know. If one of those doing the explaining entertains such a thought, his pupils will not know it. The explainer's basic task is to enter into a relationship with his pupil focused on solving problems. Then the learning process takes place all by itself, so as not to distract them with, the, with attention to the actual learning or the memorization. The thought of somebody out there teaching has to be rejected. 
As they work together, the consciousness of a dividing line between teacher and pupil is obliterated. The problem-solving process brings with it the necessary knowledge, and what actually takes place is a recalling of things forgotten. This is the reflex, the reflex arc, you know, as in Pavlov. Stimulus reaction. When necessary, I decide. It is very important that what they do should have a direct effect on people around them. And now they are studying not for themselves. That is very important. They are concerned about how to share what they are learning with others. Marks aren't important to them. They know that in a few days they will have to explain it all to someone else. They have been entrusted with the beginning of the learning process. Each pupil, pupil you see here has been assigned a group. He observes how his designated pupils work on the construction and watches to see that members of his group do not fall behind their schoolmates. Considerable emphasis is laid on motivation, the idea of service to others, and if they learn anything, they learn to understand the soul, the aspirations and the thoughts of another individual. It's not the mathematics that's important here, but rather man's learning mathematics. Not maths for its own sake, but maths for the sake of progress toward truth. And the more powerful this, for the sake of, motive is, the more successful will be one's immersion into a field of knowledge. It is important to be an atmosphere of sincerity with no feelings of being offended or irritated. That's wrong is a phrase we never use. In the old Russian language, there is no stoppage of motion and no bad words. In ancient times, people, no matter what their ethnic affiliation, never used a bad word in reference to anything. It simply doesn't exist, so why pay attention to it? What is bad does not exist. If you find yourself at a dead end, when the words you would use to get out of that dead end would be phrases like, turn right, turn left, climb up, hinting at which way one should go, but not snapping, you're standing the wrong way. Today's Rus Russophobes commit sacrilege by saying, speak Russian, when they actually mean cursing. That is not Russian at all. Kobzev has a very succinct expression of his thought. From our Slav forebears we have heard midst happenings of great dimension. They paid to language, phrase, and word a special homage and attention. That is true, so people who work with them should have a deep vocabulary range which excludes thought-distracting, incidental words. Words warmed by feelings have special significance. Truth, their legacy, it's all spiritual. The child must be enrolled in a natural cosmic process, eternal self-reproduction. Then you have given the child eternity, the joy of life, real existence, not just illusory forms like, see here, son? I've bought you a shirt and trousers and shoes. Now I can die. But what have you really given your son? Your gifts, after all, won't last more than a single season. If only you had given your son a good, your good name, your honor, your work, your friends, a flourishing people. If you had given him an understanding of the truth of being and, and a life of wisdom, then you could say, Son, I have given you the most important thing. You will be happy. You will buy shirts and build houses. You know now how it is done. Listening to the academic Shetanin speak and observing his interactions with the children, I noticed that they were very much like what Anastasia had said about children. And I wondered, how could a lonely Siberian recluse and this gray-haired academic think so much alike? Almost identically, in fact. And come to think of it, why is he talking with me at all? Why did he receive me so warmly, even setting the table and offering me a meal? He's taken me around the school, shown me everything. Why? What kind of education expert am I? I'm nobody. One who used to get pretty poor marks in school. But of course, Anastasia has somehow been at it again. Of course, it was only thanks to Anastasia that I ended up at Shetton in school in the first place. But he and I didn't talk about her. We talked about all sorts of other things, everyday things. Each time I visited, we would walk around and see how the construction of this unusual temple building was progressing. As for my books, he said tersely, it's very accurate. And that was it. A few days after my first visit, after the day I had come with a group of conference participants and had shown them Nastya, asking her to warm everybody with her gaze, the following incident occurred. 
Mikhail Petrovich and I were walking along one of the school corridors and I was keeping my eye peeled for her. I searched for her the way people intuitively search for a source which emits light. Nastia's light had gone, has gone out, Shetnan said all of a sudden. Right now I'm in the process of restoring her strength. It's coming along, but slowly. She, she'll need some time to fully recover. What do you mean it's gone out? Why? She's a strong lass. What happened? Yes, she is strong, but she had a very powerful emotional outburst. I stood there in Shetnan's office, angry and irritated at myself. Why had I done such a thing? For just whose benefit was I trying to prove something? I had utterly failed to heed Anastasia's warning. Neither my appearance in the flesh nor any miracles performed in public will pour the light of fate into the faithless. They, only will ex they will only exacerbate the feeling of irritation on the part of those who do not like someone else's perception of the world. That's enough, I thought to myself. I shall no longer try to show people, and I shan't write any more. That's it. Look what a mess I've made with my writing. I was thinking this to myself, but then Shetnan suddenly said out loud, You shouldn't stop writing, Vladimir. And then he came over to me, placed his hand on my shoulder, and looking me straight in the eye, began vocalizing a tune. I could hear how easily he took the high notes, but even more amazing was the fact that the melody he was vocalizing was very similar to the one Anastasia had sung for me in the taiga. As I made my way back to the main door, I passed the same hall where the pupils were still scurrying about. There was Nastia sitting on a chair. I went over to her. She got up, raised her head, and her rather weary eyes brightened in a second, emitting a light and warmth with their sparkle. I realized now that she was giving of her energy and warmth to others. She was giving her all without reservation to help that other Anastasia, the one in Siberia, fulfill her dream, for it had now become their shared dream. So what was going on here? What was the force behind that dream? Why were they with complete self-sacrifice and the child's gaze? Is it possible to become worthy, even, even partially worthy, of such a gaze during a single lifetime? I wondered. Aloud I said, Well, hello, Nastya. And to myself, You don't have to, Nastya. Thank you. Forgive me. I'll see you out, the girl offered. Lena and I will go with you to your car. As we drove off, I kept looking behind me until the car rounded a corner, watching the little figures standing there at the end of the road by the mansion under a lamp post as they got smaller and smaller. They weren't waving their arms in the usual sign of farewell. Each one of them held one hand raised in the air, palm out turned in the direction of the departing vehicle. I knew what this meant. Shetnan had explained it to me earlier. It signified, we send you our rays of good, may they follow you wherever you go. And once more I felt fired up with the thought, what do I need to accomplish to become worthy of your rays? Chapter 19. What to agree with, what to believe. My meeting with Mikhail Petrovich Shetinin and my acquaintance with, with his amazing school took place after my second visit to Anastasia. After seeing this school, I had virtually no lingering doubts about Anastasia's pronouncements on raising children or about the way she communicated with our son. But back there in the taiga, everything within me had rebelled against her. I didn't want to believe her, at least not everything she said. As I write these lines, I can hear many readers saying, either aloud or to themselves, Come on, how could he possibly doubt? After all, there have been so many times he was obliged to concede that she was right, and still he carries on like an idiot, unable to perceive a new phenomenon. My daughter, Polina, sent me a video cassette from one of the readers' conferences. I watched as a scholar from Novosibirsk by the name of Speransky declared right from the podium, Megre is, is incapable of fully grasping what Anastasia says. He hasn't the brains for it. I do not feel offended by him. On the contrary, this whole talk was most interesting. The audience listened with bated breath, and thanks to him I have been able to comprehend that Anastasia is an essence, a self-sufficient substance. I myself have no expertise in such matters. I have been involved in a completely different line of work. But what about all those who are into studying nature or children? 
Why have they been keeping so quiet, barely uttering a peep about what they know? And even children in their letters to me tell me I should be more attentive to what Anastasia says and does. But I can respectfully assure my readers that I have indeed become much more attentive to her. Nevertheless, I cannot refrain from arguing with her or from doubting. I cannot refrain since I am unwilling to admit that I and our whole society are complete idiots. I am unwilling to believe that we are heading down a path of degeneration. And so I am trying to find at least some justification for our actions, or some reason for saying her world view is not ap applicable to our modern way of life. And I shall go on trying as long as I have the strength to do so. After all, if I didn't, I would have to own up not only to the fact that she is right, but also to the terrifying situation you and I find ourselves in today. And if we are going to admit the existence of a hell, then we ourselves are paving the road to that hell. Let's just take, for example, the matter of child raising. I'm speaking not just for myself, but for others in the same boat and I think there are quite a few of us. I was an average pupil in school. My father put, punished me every time I got a poor mark. I wasn't, it wasn't just a matter of keeping me from playing outdoors with other kids or buying some toy. It was more severe than that. And all this struck fear into me, a fear greater than the strap. I was always in fear of something bigger. And every time I stepped up to the chalkboard, it was like stepping up to the scaffold. And I used to tear pages out of my den devnik. Marvelous school days, still ringing, textbooks and notebooks and singing, so fast and fleeting, alack. No one can now bring them back. Will they then vanish without any trace? No one, no none can ever their memory erase. Marvelous school days. Remember the words to that song? They taught us to make us believe how marvelous our school days were. Brainwashing, brainwashing. But we also remember, especially us average kids, and we're the majority after all, how glad we were to chuck those hated school bags aside just as soon as the summer holidays began. And just how marvelous can school days be for a child who has a physiological need to move around when he's required to sit a whole 45 minutes in a prescribed pose, arms neatly folded on his desk without hardly moving a muscle? Sure, the slow and sluggish types can take it, but what about the child who is agile, temperamental, and impulsive by nature? But under the one-size-fits-all approach, it's as though everybody were robots, no individuality. Sit there or else, the child is told. And the little fellow sits there, trying to endure the 45 minutes, and then, after a 10-minute break, another 45, then a month, a year, 10 years, and the only way out is to give in. Most importantly, to resign himself to the fact that he will have to keep resigning himself to things his whole life long. He will have to live the way society dictates, marry the way society dictates, and go to war directly, directly the order is given. He must unfailingly believe in anything he is told. People who willingly resign themselves are very easy to control. Only it's best if they're physically healthy and up to all sorts of tasks. But then they start drinking and taking drugs. But doesn't a man do this to escape, even for a moment? Doesn't he try to escape from his prison of utter subjection to something his heart and soul cannot possibly comprehend? They don't, in fact, pass all that quickly, those school days. They drag out in torture periods of 45 minutes each. Our great-great-grandfathers, grandfathers and fathers believed, and we today believe, that that's how it should be, that the child is basically ignorant and that he must be forced into things for his own good. And so, today, our children, our Vanyas, Kolyas, Sashas, and Mashinkas, attend school too. And we today, just like our forefathers centuries ago, believe that we are sending them there for their own good, for knowledge and the truth. This is where we must stop. Let's think seriously about it. Let us remember Russia in the pre-revolutionary days. Our great-grandfathers are sitting at their school desks, not yet grown-up children. They are taught religion, history, and what kind of life they are supposed to lead. 
those that don't learn by rote or are slow to grasp the proffered world view the way they are told to get a sound drubbing on their hands or head from the teacher for their own good. But then the revolution comes along and all of a sudden adults acknowledge that what the schools have been teaching the children is rubbish and brainwashing. Everything is old. Everything old is thrown out of the classroom and new indoctrination takes its place. Religion is sheer nonsense. Man is evolved from monkeys. Put on red scarves, form up in lines, read poetry, and above all, glorify communism. And so the pioneers glorify communism, read poetry at the top of their lungs, and give honor to adults. For our happy children, we thank you, our native land. And once more, those who don't try hard enough are subjected to deprivations, beatings, and public condemnation. But then, in our own era, before our very eyes, all of a sudden, new directives are handed down. Take off the red scarves. The red plague overcame us. Communism, that's nothing but terror and hypocrisy. Man for monkeys? Sheer rubbish. We have a different progenitor now. The market. Democracy. This is truth. Where the truth is, and where false dogma is still by no means clear. But children, once again, are sitting at their desks without so much as a stir, and over by the chalkboard still stands a teacher as strict as can be. For ages, children have been under the shadow of a spiritual sadism. Like a ferocious beast, invisible and frightening, it tries to chase each newborn child as quickly as possible into a kind of invisible cage. The beast has some faithful soldier allies. Who are they? Who is spiritually scoffing at our children, scoffing at every man that comes into this world? What is their name, their profession? What? Can we simply accept that their name is school teacher or parent? An educated parent, perhaps. There's no way I can accept that right off. What about you? Today in Russia, teachers are not being paid their wages on time. The teachers are on strike. We won't teach the children, they say. Tell me, is it good or bad when someone is not paid the wages owed them? Of course it's bad. After all, people need something to live on. But what if there are actually spiritual sadists among those on strike? Now tell me, is it good or bad not to give money to those who scoff at your child? Anyway, the teacher strikes gave me a pause for some rather interesting reflection. Right now, all the major cities have private schools, whose organizers select the most talented teachers and pay them a decent wage, in the neighborhood of twice what they would get in a regular school. Not all parents manage to get their children into a private school, even if they have enough money to pay for the tuition, simply because there are not enough private schools to go around. And why aren't there enough? The answer is simple, because there aren't enough good teachers. The founders of private schools can't find them. Another question, if they can't find teachers even at a good salary, who are all those people on strike? Now there's a question for you. Only please believe me, I'm in no way wishing out of the whole cross-section of our society to point the fingers at teachers alone. When I speak about them, I'm including myself too. After all, I'm one of them. I too, after all, as a parent, made my daughter study what she was taught in school. And then, when Perestroika came along, I asked her, What is your teacher telling you about history now? Only to hear in reply, The teacher talks, but it's like he isn't saying anything. And what could I say to my daughter about that? So I simply advised her, well, don't go philosophizing about it. Just get on with your studies. Today we have strikes. But is, but is it only teachers? Doctors are on strike. So are minors. So are academic researchers. The strikers write on their pla placards, Down with the government. Down with the president. It's all quite logical according to the strikers. After all, there is no pay. It means the authorities are not carrying out their duties. Everything in their demands seems logical to us today, but what about tomorrow? Again, a question to be answered. Perhaps it will come out tomorrow that the government and the president have been standing on the bright side all along, saving the whole earth from invaders and vampires, perhaps against their will, unwittingly risking loss of power under a hail of malevol m malevol malevolence.
by their refusal to give money to the sadists and destroyers of people's souls and bodies, as well as the earth. And yet the latter have hysterically portrayed themselves as martyrs in the public eye. Today it's martyrs, in the context of today's positions and dogma, but tomorrow there will be a different dogma, and who will be portrayed as what, as what is not yet clear. Anastasia says, Everybody is choosing an unreliable path for themselves. They always get what is coming to them, not in the next life, but in this one. But with the dawn of each new day, each one of us is given the opportunity to determine whether their path is true or not. And the choice is up to you. You are free to choose which path to take. You are a man. Become consciously aware of what you really are. You are a man born to be in paradise. I asked her, where is that? Where is it, that paradise? Who's been leading us into some kind of swamp? And she replied, man creates everything for himself. Just try to fathom what she said next. She was affirming, after all, that the time has now come for the speeding up of some kind of process is in the universe. And those whose way of life does not correspond to the natural laws of being will be subjected to trials, at first in the most ordinary way, clear and understandable. And these trials will serve as a good sign for becoming consciously aware of their actions and the path they are following. For those who don't manage to do this, more troubles will ensue, and then they will have to forsake life in order to be regenerated as healthy beings, but only after 9,000 years. And it turns out, according to her, that miners tearing open the veins of the earth, modern medical doctors thrusting themselves into genetic engineering, scientists inventing deadly products, all these have already been shown the first sign in the form of their rejection by society and their failure to achieve financial peace of mind. Those of them who possess material goods today suffer even more from lack of moral satisfaction, as they are subconsciously aware of how harmful their activity is and how it is bringing no real good to anyone. I tried to object, arguing that coal was needed for factories, but she countered, What factories? The ones that smoke and burn up the air intended for man to breathe, and turn out steel to make machine guns and bullets? In other words, she maintains that the system we have created to provide artificial conditions for life is so imperfect that all its present achievements will result in terrible cataclysms. The ground that has been dug up beneath our large cities where natural underground streams and pure springs welling up from the depths of the earth have been replaced by systems of pipes and taps is unable to restore itself and is rotting away, bringing this rot along with the water into everyone's taps, Anastasia went on. The time will come when mankind will understand. The most important scientists will come and pay a visit to the grandmother on her plot of land. Famished, they will ask her to give them a tomato for something to eat. The scientists and their illusory creations are not needed by that grandmother today. She knows nothing of them herself, nor does she want to know. She lives a quiet life without the scientists' help, while they cannot live without her. They inhabit a world of fruitless illusions leading nowhere. She is with the natural earth and the whole universe. The universe needs her. It does not need them. I tried to object to that. If we don't produce weapons, but only take care of the land, we will become weak and risk being easily conquered by technologically advanced powers that do have weapons. They're having a problem protecting themselves from their own weapons, replied Anastasia, and from the social cataclysms these weapons engender. Sure, I said, they will abandon everything and come after our grandmothers on their plots of lands and come after your dochniks with their machine guns and our grandmothers will have no machine guns of their own to fight back. But will they get that far? What do you think? Will they not fight to the death among themselves over our grandmothers? So there you have it. If we're not going to argue with Anastasia and simply trust what she says, then we have to admit to ourselves that we're complete idiots, nothing but fruit-hungry worms. That's not something we're willing to own up to. So, not understanding, perhaps, everything in Anastasia, I am trying to find at least some sort of justification of what we have been creating in our world. 
and should I not be able to find any reasonable justification? Should I be obliged to admit that the path we are following is completely untenable? Then, and what then? Let's think about it a bit. Perhaps we should give our children the freedom to grow up without our dogma, then a and then ask the children where and which way we should go. Anastasia talks about how children whom we have not corrupted spiritually will find the way to winning salvation for both themselves and us, or rather to attain the paradise given us right from the beginning. It turns out everything in our world is simple, yet not so simple. Why, tell me, why not extend the experience of academic Shetanin school to other places? Why not set up at least one such school in every major city? Well, it's not all that simple, it turns out. I asked Shetanin to set up a, such a school in Novosibirsk, and he, he agreed. But who is going to provide the space? A good question. I asked Shetanin. And what if people can be found in other cities to set up a foundation? Would you be able to organize at least one such school in various cities? It's impossible to settle everything right away, Vladimir. Why? We shan't be able to find that many teachers for all the schools. And again the thought, what's this about there not being enough teachers? Who are those people out on strike? Academic Shetanin School is a regular government-supported institution. It's not a private school. It comes under the, the Ministry of Education of the Russian Federation and does not charge tuition fees. But why is it located far away in the mountains, in a ravine? Why? And why was there an attempt on academic Shetanin's life? And why was his brother killed? And why do the Cossacks help guard the school? Who doesn't like this school? Who is interfering with? Who is it interfering with? I was invited to a meeting with the Education Committee of the State Duma. Officials there had read the first two books, Anastasia and The Ringing Cedars of Russia, and there were people on the Duma Education Committee who shared and understood Anastasia's views, good people. I told them about Shetanin. They know him very well and have great respect for him. Then what's the problem, I asked. Why is nothing changing in the educational system in this country? Children are suffering as they did before. Every time they step up to the chalkboard, it's like going to the scaffold. And they s sit still at their desks without stirring. I was saddened by their response, which unfortunately has tragic consequences for those who are still children today. Paradoxically, it is the teachers, the teachers themselves, who have turned out to be an insurmountable barrier, as I heard and understood this gruesome reply. What would become, tell me, of the whole raft of academic titles and degrees, the countless dissertations on the subject of child raising? What would become of our research institutes? After all, they've worked out a whole system. The machinery has been set in motion, and its flywheel can't be stopped with the wave of a wand. Anyone who has defended a doctoral thesis, especially one who has achieved professional rank, is going to stick as hard as he can to his own views. I also learned how a woman member of the Duma lamented after visiting Shetanin school. I don't understand anything that's going on in that school. It's quite out of the ordinary, something like a sect. I wasn't aware of the specific meaning of the word sect, Russian, secta. Later, I looked up the definition in the dictionary, which read as follows. Sect, from Latin, secta, teaching, movement, school. 1. A religious community or group which has cut itself off from the prevailing church. 2. An isolated group of people absorbed in their own narrow group interests. It is not clear in what sense the Duma member was using this word, but I feel neither definition is really apl applicable to Shetanin's school, and if it has indeed cut itself off, has it cut itself off from the good or the bad? I think if it has cut itself off at all, then it has detached itself from the st sadistic treatment of children. As for the Duma, as long as its members make such statements, I have nothing to say. Let readers themselves consider whether and in what measure the second definition quoted above s applies to certain factions in the Duma an isolated group of people absorbed in their own narrow group interests. Does that mean they're a sect? 
Shetanin was shot at. But he is a man. Now the Cossacks, perhaps, will help to some degree. And Anastasia promised to protect the new shoots. Now I realize it would be better for her not to come out of her taiga, at least for the time being. If she were just slightly more aggressive, she could easily zap dissertations, academic titles, and all sorts of rot with her ray. But no way. A gentler approach, she says, is needed. People's consciousness needs changing. Anyway, here I've gone and written down my thoughts about child raising in our modern schools. Only they've come out rather chaotic, not very sincere. Not very sincere, since... If I were to describe how I really feel about our schools, I'd have to resort to some pretty foul language, but my style of writing has somehow changed after my talks with Anastasia. There are a lot of words that simply wouldn't fit in. I would still like to say a word to all those teachers who have been able, in spite of the system, to impact their, impart to their children even a smidgen of good and, as Shetanin says, enroll them in the natural cosmic process. Thank you. Along with my deepest respect. And there's another thing I have learned from what Anastasia says about child raising. Namely, that first and foremost comes the conscious awareness of the child as an individual. By comparison with us adults, youngsters are, of course, physically weaker, but at the same time immeasurably kinder than we are unsullied and not bound by dogma. And before we go filling children's heads with any kind of moralizing, we need to understand something about the world ourselves. Ourselves! We need to think things through ourselves, and to forget about somebody else's dogma, at least for a time. As for us entrepreneurs, we too have to somehow seek out teachers in each city, help create foundations for the schools where we shall be teaching our children and grandchildren.